time for us to begin our service today. And we'll begin by singing, I know whom I have believed. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love
towards prayer this morning. Indeed, you see in the bulletin a number of folks that need special prayer. Barbara Fultz had surgery, hip surgery, and she's just in a lot of pain. And we want to pray for her today and then so many others. There's a beautiful song of praise that just kind of leads us heavenward. And I just want you to sing it gently with me. We, I will praise thee. I will praise thee with my whole time was that you could muster all of your heart to praise him so easily the enemy seems to distract us even in his house God's house and our cares kind of cover us in I've got this decision and that decision and you know my phone just tweeted and I've got to email somebody I think the world is yet to see what could happen if a group like this all at one time with all of our heart would praise him. Think about it. When's the last time? Could we try it today? I will praise thee I will praise thee, here it is, with my whole heart. I will praise thee, for thou hast multiplied thy mercies unto me. And I will sing praises unto thee. things you do for us that go unnoticed surely of all the blessings you pour out the greatest is just to sense your presence and to know how close you are right now to us by your Holy Spirit fill our hearts allow our praise to come from deep within everything we have to lift it before you and give glory to your name Father, I pray for Barbara Fultz today, 
that you will touch her. In Jesus' name, I pray for Artis Hauk with pneumonia that you will touch her and heal in Jesus' name and so many others. Allow this to be a day filled with your presence as we honor mothers and as you touch them. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Before you're seated, greet somebody with a handshake and a smile. In the name of the Lord, we you? We have gathered here today just to praise your holy name. You are worthy of the glory and the praise. Let your presence fill this place, your sweet anointing and your grace. Now to you, O Lord, from within our hearts we we are to just singing for the next hour <laughs> hallelujah there's praise in my heart today thanksgiving what a joy to sing in his presence we're going to honor some folks today of course our mothers a, a little later by the way mothers we have a very special gift for you on your way out today and show make sure you pick that up and uh we just want to bless you in several ways today. But there are others to be honored and mentioned today, and I want to do that. Uh, the Minnesota District Council of the Assemblies of God, where many in this congregation are credentialed, every year has a statewide meeting, and it's called District Council. At that district council this year, uh, the 29th and 30th of April, uh, two of our own, three of our own, were recognized and honored in some special ways. And 
I wanted to make sure that we recognize them first since they attend here, but in addition, they're extensions of our church's ministry. I've always told you that our Sunday morning attendance is not the full view of the effect and the influence that God has given us for the kingdom of God. Our missionaries around the world, some in the state, and we want to recognize two of those today. Maybe you didn't know, but Pastor Sherry Lane on the keyboard and our music pastor directs our choir on Sunday, but during the week, she is a licensed, credentialed chaplain along with being a credentialed minister, and she serves one major place, a Presbyterian home on the north side, but then also uh, several hours she adds to her work at another care facility. And at District Council, 29th and 30th of April, she was recognized out of 39 chaplains in the state of Minnesota as Chaplain of the Year. Boy, that's exciting, I'll tell you what. Uh, the journey that she's made and all of the work she's done to not just be credentialed as a pastor, but add to that the recognized and required chaplaincy uh, schooling and such. She has uh, long ago completed all that, and she is an extension of us, and you bless us not just on Sundays, but your ministry through the week as well. And I'm going to have her join me in a little while, and we're going to pray for her. But uh, also at that same district council, uh, Pastor Wes and Nancy Vogley were recognized for 50 years of ordained ministry. Uh, a little backstory, some of you may know some of it, but uh, Wes was a, uh, a journeyman plumber in the North Duluth area, and God called them to ministry, and they came down to Bible school here in North Central, and while they attended there, uh, Wes was my father's associate pastor on north side, northeast Minneapolis. And uh, so I would see them every Sunday. You know, I was, let's see, I'm 32 now. <laughs> I was an early teen, and then on through high school as they served and blessed my father, blessed our church, and the connection started between them and myself a lot of years ago now. And then they went to Pioneer Church, opened a brand new church in a city that didn't have one in Houghton Hancock, Michigan. How many know where that is? It's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. It's a lot more clear there than International Falls where I serve, but uh, the Harbingers Quartet, who will sing next week for you, I'll never forget as long as I live. We went up to sing at their church from Minneapolis to North Michigan up there. Uh, the last Sunday in April, the day we were there, they had snow flurries and got 12 inches of snow. We drove through on the way up there and the way back some tiny towns. And as I remember it, the snow was so high, there were several homes that the people had to go in and out of their home through the attic window. And we kept thinking, what are we doing up here? They then pastored in uh, Hutchinson and other places uh, later he was called and elected to the district office to be the state secretary treasurer and served there for years and then uh, he was asked to be the regional director five six seven states i can't remember of rv maps rv maps is the ministry where retired folks take an rv and they'll go to some church 
and they'll spend months uh, helping to remodel a church, to build onto the church, uh, all that, build a new church, whatever. Uh, I, I feel bad that I have to tell you in the winter time they go to Florida and Arizona, but <clears throat> Nancy is, is involved in all of these ministries as much as Wes has been, even with the RVs. There's a lot of work that the ladies have been doing, helping and painting and tools and all, just all kinds of stuff. And so uh, they have been recognized for 50 years of ordained ministry. I contacted the district and had them send me a little two and a half minute clip that they showed that evening. Jim, I wonder if you'd hit all the lights. Wes and Nancy Vogley have been in ministry since 1970. They've been married for 62 years. Wes began his career at a plumbing apprenticeship program and became licensed in 1962. Upon being called into ministry, Wes enrolled at North Central Bible College and worked full-time plumbing. He graduated with a pastoral studies degree in 1970. Wes then went on to serve as a pastor for 20 years in Hancock, Michigan, Painesville, Minnesota, and Hutchinson, Minnesota. While he pastored, he also served on the board of presbyters and as an executive presbyter in Minnesota. In 1990, Wes was elected to serve at the Minnesota District AG as Secretary Treasurer, where he served for 14 years. After his retirement in 2004, Wes was invited to become North Central Regional Missionary Director of the RV Volunteers Ministry. He served there until his resignation in 2021. Wes says, I believe that our greatest ministry has been raising a family to love and serve the Lord. We are blessed. Looking back, we can see how God worked my two careers together, plumbing and pastoral. We can have the lights. Would you just help me bless those folks as well? Now I'm coming down here because there's more room and I'd like Pastor Sherry, if you'll come, Pastor Wes and Nancy, if you'll come, followed by the advisory committee of our church. We just want to lay hands on these folks and pray and wish them God's blessing on this particular day. The advisory committee as well, please come. Come right up here. Come right up to the front and turn and face our audience. Sorry. <laughs> and I wonder if you folks would stand as well in honor and several just lay your hands on these folks, will you? In Jesus' name. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you have blessed with special giftings these precious folks. And they are willing to use all of the gifts within them to just accomplish your purpose and to move your kingdom forward. It doesn't get any better than that. Father, I pray your continued blessing on their lives, on their ministries, that health would be their portion, that you'd pour in your anointing and your spirit upon them, and they would continue to serve in such great ways to acknowledge your call on their life, but also their heart's desire to share the gospel with people anywhere, everywhere. We pray these things, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, would you bless them? Thank you, folks. Sherry, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You have a bulletin in your hand and several things within it, but next Sunday, the Harbingers Quartet will be here in concert. Uh, Pastor Dick and I sing with them, and uh, we're just excited. We've gotten to the age where this could very well be the last concert we give, at least for some time. 
until God strengthens all of us. But uh, don't miss that hour next Sunday at 10 o'clock. We'll also be able to put that on video and have that the week after on YouTube as well. The ushers are coming to serve us. Pastor is coming. Uh, Tim, would you come also? And let's just uh, pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, we come with our obedience and our offering. We ask that you would take and bless and break it to meet the needs of your church around the world. Amen. There's a song I started singing As a child in Sunday school It made me feel so good to sing it I loved it then and I still do Thirty kids in an old church basement and one piano out of tune and mrs brown would ask for favorites when i raised my hand she already knew the sweetest song this side of heaven Sung by children young and old The sweetest song this side of heaven Is Jesus loves me, this I know melody is very simple and the words are simple too but what makes this song so special is just knowing it's all oh so true the sweetest song this side of heaven Sung by children young and old The sweetest song this side of heaven Is Jesus loves me, this I know the sweetest song this side of heaven Yes, Jesus loves me The sweetest song this side of heaven The Bible tells me so The sweetest song side of heaven sung by children young and old the sweetest song this side of heaven as Jesus loves me this I know as Jesus loves me this I know We have to sing it. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells we're going to sing that again. Yes, Jesus 
loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Our morning is fast getting away from us, so I'm going to move right into my message. Ladies, we have a gift for you. Please pick one up on your way out. For me, maybe you've heard me say it before, but holidays are unusually difficult for me to preach. Uh, funerals are the same. The reason why is when I say my first word, everybody knows where I'm going before I get there. And uh, some years ago now, I read a piece, and I'll share part of it with you, but with a, a, an unusual title. And I thought about it and said, that would be a good Mother's Day sermon title someday. I hope the title's not better than the sermon. But the title is, What If I Ruin My Kids? What if I ruin my kids? I know some of you are thinking, he should have preached that 20 years ago. I recently read a message that one woman wrote on a piece of paper and handed it to her pastor. She wrote, I have never taken it lightly to have children. It seems overwhelmingly weighty to make me be responsible for forming another person's character for 18 years and beyond. It has absolutely terrified me in the past, and for a time I decided not to have kids. As I have found my identity in Christ, however, I have also found strength to agree to willingly have children and obey God's call on my life, but I'm still so afraid of perpetuating my own dysfunction and sins into them. I'm afraid of childbirth also, but Ruining their hearts scares me the most. I would love to hear any advice you have for me. Thank you. Here's part of his response with my embellishments. There are glories in motherhood that every woman should think about and embrace and rejoice as God calls them to motherhood. Recognizing when you use the word glories in this context that not all of the glories that God intended has come to fruition in the way he intended. When sin came into the world, it changed a lot of things. But in this situation, the, the mother and the glory of what God has done is beautiful and precious. Thank you, honey. And God's, that's my wife, by the way. I don't just call... <laughs> Anybody, honey? I suppose there's people on the video saying I'm not going to watch him again. <laughs> um, but there are things that are profoundly significant and beautiful and precious in God's sight and essential for his purposes in the world. And here's a few. Every man... Every woman who has ever lived, however great or small, owes his life to a woman they call mother. It's a glorious thing that human life originates in the womb of a woman and is sustained for nine months and in several cultures and several times sustained by the mother for a year or longer after that. 
both Moses and Paul saw this such a glorious thing, a great wonder of the world, that a mother should be continually amazed at it. To be sure, all the glories of this life don't have the same glow that God intended, but the glory still shines through, and in Christ we are meant to embrace them and free them as much as we can from the condemnation of the fall. Immediately following the words of God's judgment on the serpent, the woman and the man in the book of Genesis, and immediately before he would make clothes for them from animal skins, right in that minimal interview, interval, God said this, as Moses records Genesis 3 and 20, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. It seems clear to me that God intends then that this <coughs> would come exactly in his thinking at this particular time, after the curse, before the mercy of those clothing skins. And God intends this then to be seen as a gift of unspeakable grace. Both Adam and Eve were warned that day that they eat of this fruit, that they would die. And in one sense, they did perish, but instead of only death, not only did they live a while, but Eve becomes the source of all human life. Now, God could have brought life in a different way. This is what he chose. Eve is one of those people that I'd love to spend an afternoon with. I fear she would do all the talking, though. You'll get that tomorrow. Paul tries to show how significant this all is in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 11. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. In other words, every man that has ever lived, every woman who has ever lived, great or small, owes their life to their mother. The Psalms multiply the glory and the wonder of all of life originating in woman by saying very clearly that her womb is no mere natural cocoon but the sacred place of God's own personal handiwork himself. Now I have to deviate here a little bit, uh, some personal thoughts. Uh, and, and I've gone down this track before, but this would be another uh, building block in the stone foundation of your believing in Christ and God and all of that. <coughs> Uh, I don't understand people that are evolutionists. <clears throat> After all these million years, they've not been able to recreate what God did in an instant. <laughs> that went over big. You know, I keep thinking about it. I had an eye exam a couple of weeks ago, and they took pictures of my eye. And there are muscles and stuff in there, but he said, see those little tiny lines? And I said, yeah. He said, those are blood vessels that are carrying blood to and through your eye. Evolutionists, do that, I dare you. Right? If you think you can make your eye uh, uh, out of nothing and put flesh and then add those little tiny vessels and then have it move back and forth and up and down at will, folk, did you know in reality you're all upside down? Where are the medical people? You know, 
Your eye focuses things upside down to begin with. Do that, evolutionists, I dare you. The, the womb of a woman is the sacred place of God's own personal handiwork himself. Oh. I have a twin brother. He's going to be singing with us next week here. And uh, uh, we are a lot alike, but we are different. God created two of us at the same time, but gave us enough differences so I can tell who I am when I look in the mirror. God's sacred place of his own personal handiwork. The 139th Psalm puts it like this, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. God is at work in the womb of every mother, and his hands are forming an everlasting human being just as closely as if he were using his fingers and knitting needles, and that is great glory, hallelujah. I don't know if you caught in there uh, that God is forming an everlasting human being. You will live forever somewhere. How marvelous that God is at work and creating and knitting together an everlasting human being. All oh, that you would receive Christ, ask him to forgive your sin, and spend that eternity in heaven with God. I was going to say in us, and I should say in some of us, and most of us. In my, <laughs> uh, you're not going to get out of here today without smile at least. In my opinion, the most influential people in the world are mothers. The Bible goes on and describes the glorious ongoing shaping of every human by the influence and teaching of their mother. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 8, Hear my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Mom has given her sons and daughters life, and now, by her teaching, she gives them garlands and pendants for their neck. They're, entire, they're intended to be uh, glorious signs of her ministry and input into our life as she teaches and raises us. You know, I've been married uh, 50 years, and that's a lot longer than the 16 or 17 years that I lived with my mother. I tease and say she has more to do with how I am today than my mom did, but that's not true. <clears throat> the basic things within us is happening long before we reach the age of 16. The mold is set and some of the things within us mimic what we have learned at an early age, that's all part of what God is saying in his word about the ministry and love and teaching of our mother. Thousands may rise to positions of power all over the world. All of them come from the womb and the influence of mothers, even kings and presidents. Proverbs chapter 31, we know as the description of a beautiful mother. I won't read that all. We've done that before. But the very first verse has some interesting thoughts. The words of King Lemuel, 
an oracle that his mother taught him. We've got to break that down a little bit. He says he's going to put pen to paper by the anointing and inspiration of God that this needed to be kept. And he began to write the description of a holy, beautiful, spiritual mother and woman. And he does so by the things that mom has taught him. So not only do we have the words of a king, which are substantial by themselves, but you've got Holy Scripture as the oracle of his mother that she taught him. And in Proverbs there, the king is inspired by the Holy Spirit and is included in Holy Writ. God's design in all of this is that a mother should be duly honored, or you could say appropriately glorified for her gifts, and her sacrifices to her children. By the way, mothers, we know that your sacrifices have not ended just because the kids are out of the house or have gotten married. We know that the heartache, the joy has not ceased no matter if you're 120 years old today. Children are to honor their mothers because their mothers have done an honorable and glorious thing in all that they have birthed and influence. Ephesians 6 tells us that. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the earth is the promise that goes along with that. Jesus experienced in a very similar way the sorrows that a mother may feel when giving birth, particularly raising children. A mother weeps, even grieves for her children, times without end. It matters not how old the children grow to be, a mother never stops caring, praying for them. There are times it would seem even to this day that their children would tear their heart apart. Jesus himself experienced similar uh, feelings and emotions at one point. In the 23rd chapter of Matthew, it reads, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. So we have Jesus comparing himself to a hen, really a mother's longing and aching, crying, praying, reaching out for the wayward child as he overlooks Jerusalem and they're not coming and Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem. Mom, Jesus knows what you're going through. I'm not much of an activist, meaning you won't see your pastor carrying a picket sign, pushing down or past a barricade the evening news will never carry my picture throwing stones at law enforcement or storming the Capitol in Washington, D.C. I do, however, at times just have some thoughts that can't stay in here, not so politically motivated, but uh, spiritually motivated. Interesting, the title of my message, what if I ruin my kids? Others have been trying to do that now for a long time. Ruin your kids and mine. January 1973, a landmark decision of the United States Supreme Court was issued Roe versus Wade. I don't know if there's a better Sunday for this to come out of my heart and my mouth than on Mother's Day. I was 13 years old. And knowing that I was 
headed for wanting to be a pastor, preacher someday. I remember this time, 13 years old, and it made a, a dent in my heart and know that this is not good, this is not healthy. Uh, this is at the same time where Dr. Spock said, don't discipline your kids, they'll be okay. They are not okay. You know, you can clap along anywhere you want here. <clears throat> Roe versus Wade, I looked it up. Um, landmark decision in which the court ruled that the Constitution of the United States protects a pregnant woman's liberty to choose to have an abortion without excess government restriction. The decision struck down many U.S. federal and state abortion laws. Roe fueled an ongoing abortion debate in the United States about whether or to what extent abortion should be legal and who should decide the legality of abortion and what the role of the moral and religious views in the political sphere should be. It also shaped a debate concerning which methods the Supreme Court should use in constitutional education, adjudication. <clears throat> Does anybody know why I'm bringing this up today? Anybody watch the news? Let me see your hands. These are critical days in our country, in our world, but folks, also in our spiritual world. The decision Roe versus Wade involved the case of Norma McCurvey, I hope I pronounced her, known by the legal pseudonym Jane Roe, who in 1969 became pregnant with her third child and she wanted an abortion but lived in Texas where abortion was illegal except when necessary to save the mother's life. Her attorneys filed a lawsuit on her behalf in the federal court against her local district attorney alleging that Texas's abortion laws were unconstitutional. A three-judge panel of the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Texas heard the case, ruled in her favor. Texas then appealed directly to the Supreme Court in January 1973. The Supreme Court issued a seven to two decision in Roe's favor, ruling that the due process clause of the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution provides a right to privacy that protects a pregnant woman's right to choose whether to have an abortion. It also ruled that this right is not absolute and must be balanced against government's interests in protecting women's health and prenatal life. I, I, I suppose I'm gonna get in trouble. In my opinion, I hope in your opinion, they've done little to protect prenatal life since this decision. The, classified, the court classified the right to choose as fundamental, which required courts to evaluate challenged abortion laws under the strict scrutiny standard, the highest level of judicial review in the United States. There have been millions of people praying from the time I was 13 till now that somehow this would change and some new thoughts would come in. There are folks on the Supreme Court at this point that must have conscience after all. If you've ever prayed for your leaders, if you've ever prayed for your country, if you've ever prayed for this situation, pray harder now. 
in the next few months, decisions will be made that will change the course of history once more, change the course of our land, and I couldn't help it as I was typing this out, it could change our eternity. I don't get that, Pastor. What if a nation would reverse itself, not just in this, but on several other things, and God would say, maybe they're on the right track, I might just delay the rapture a little while. If you've ever, this has tremendous consequences and changes that's ahead for us. I would know that in this room there could be women who have gone through this situation with regret. I'm not trying to judge, but to let you know that there is healing in Jesus' name and forgiveness. Truly, there are instances where health issues came into play, and I wouldn't doubt, however, there is still tremendous sorrow in our hearts. She came from a Christian home um, in our service. She came back to Christ and made tremendous changes. And started to date one of the single young men that was on our church board. And uh, one day she came to me and she said, Pastor, I've been asked to marry this young man. And she said, but before I can answer and before I could go through it, she said, I want to sh share something, and I wonder if God would forgive. She said, I've, I've had an abortion, and I, don't, I just feel so horrible. I don't know if God could ever forgive me and if I can go forward with the marriage. I told her that, yes, God would, of course, forgive. But I also mentioned that uh, in a few weeks we were going to have a water baptismal service. And I said, would you, even though you may have done that as a child or a young adult, uh, would you be part of that baptismal service? And she looked at me kind of with tilted head and she said, if you want. I said, let me tell you why. And I explained to the baptismal candidates this later, before the service, I said, uh, this whole water baptismal idea is a sacred thing and it mimics what John the Baptist did for our Savior, Jesus. And he was let down into the water but when he came up, he was a different person in that the Holy Spirit by a dove came into him in power and things were changed in his ministry from that day. I said, when, when I put people under the water and water baptism, you are separated from all life-giving force. If I keep you down long enough, you'll drown. And just like Jesus, you're separated from life-giving, but when you come up and take that first breath, you're a clean, new person. I said, let's, let's pray, let's believe that when you come up out of that water that you'll be separated from all that stuff behind and you'll be clean, a new person, able to move ahead. We didn't have a baptismal tank in our church. We had to use a hotel. We went to a pool. Maybe it was a school, I guess. And I wish you could have seen the expression on her face when I brought her up and the water parted.
God forgives. She went on, had two great kids. The very fact that I bring all this up now on Mother's Day and openly ask you to pray about this should, without doubt, clarify on which issue, uh, side of the issue I stand. What comes to mind is he who is on the Lord's side, come unto me. Not politically motivated, but I will tell you that we've lost millions of God's handiwork and God's heart grieves today. Here's some thoughts to leave you with. Every man that has ever lived, however small or great, owes his life to a woman, his mother. A mother's womb is no mere natural cocoon, but the sacred place of God's own personal handiwork. Again, the 139th Psalm, for you formed me in my inner parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. God is at work in the womb of every mother, and his hands are forming an everlasting human being just as closely as if he were using his fingers and knitting needles, and that is great glory. I'm gonna ask every mother in the place if you'll stand, would you just stand, moms, all over the place? We've got some in the balcony, I mean in the foyer, in the balcony we got three 21-year-olds, not who I'm talking about. <laughs> Can I first say thank you for giving us life? It's because of you and your willingness to endure, to care, to sacrifice, to influence, to teach and to love in such great ways that I, for one, am who I am today and your children likewise. In my opinion, the most influential people in the face of the earth are mothers. And I bow to you and the God in you. If you're close by, maybe a spouse or a child or both, or if you can reach to a mother whose children can't be here today, uh, I would that every mother would have someone that would stand with them right now and lay their hands on their shoulder and we'll just pray. I know there are some that children aren't able to be here but I'm going to come right down off the platform. There are three mothers right here. If you can just maybe all three join my hand or something. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, what a glorious thing you have done in creating the likes of us through these precious people. Enduring the challenge and the difficulty, the pain, so that your life would come through them and we are all the beneficiaries. I pray, Father, that new life then would surge into these lives, that you would renew their strength as the eagles, that these will be days of joy and fulfillment. And they would experience your spirit, your love, in ways they have never known, is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.
We're going to sing before I let you go. Jesus be born in me. In this same way, we invite our Savior just to come inside and live and come to fruition in our life in a brand new way today. Sing it with me. Jesus be born in me. Jesus be born in me. And make my life what it should be. Jesus be born in me. Jesus be born in me. Jesus be born in me. today. Some will join relatives, kids for lunch. Maybe later this afternoon the same. Please know that you are loved and that you are appreciated and respected not just from us humans but from the King of Glory as well. God bless you. Go rejoicing in Jesus' name.